Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we teed up a conversation about VPNs and a new way of thinking about them, something called software defined perimeters or known as SDPs. If you're not sure what a VPN is, we're just gonna break it down at a very basic level. VPNs are a way to traffic your network through an encrypted tunnel. So they they tunnel your traffic to usually a termination point as a firewall. Most people use VPNs for access to corporate networks in an enterprise environment. From a personal standpoint, a lot of people may use them for security or privacy because if I'm at a Starbucks, my traffic is visible on Starbucks network. But if I use a VPN, that traffic is encrypted through a tunnel and nobody else on that network can see it. And so a lot of people... Even enterprises use this for that reason, where people will use VPNs for security and privacy. But the majority of enterprises use it to gain access to the internal applications that are hosted on their networks. VPNs are a big thing these days because of COVID. Some companies may not have had VPNs and they stood them up very, very quickly. And so we did talk about VPN encryption in one of our previous episodes but there are a lot of different types of encryption when you implement the vpns it usually will ask you what type of encryption you'll want to use there's point to point tunnel protocol there's layer two tunnel protocol ipsec open vpn each one of these encryption methods have different capabilities different security requirements so when you're looking at those you want to figure out which one is going to be the best for you. One of the things that is very important is because VPNs terminate on a firewall and it is an incoming connection to your firewall, a lot of the encryption protocols require you to have a port open for that connection. Those different types of encryption will require different ports to be open. So for example, point-to-point tunnel protocol will require... 1723 TCP to be open. Open VPN, which is very common and it's one of the strongest encryption methods out there, requires 1194 UDP port or 443 TCP, which is a lot more um, secure for most people because 443 is generally open for SSL traffic. Now, one of the big decisions that you have to make when it comes to VPN is if you're going to split tunnel or full tunnel your traffic. When you full tunnel your traffic, it means that all your traffic will go through the tunnel, including external DNS requests, right? So most of companies use VPN for internal, but if you full tunnel it, that means if I'm going to CNN or whatever, that will tunnel my traffic through my company's network and then egress out of my company's IP. If I split tunnel it, it just means those internal DNS requests, like say for contoso.com, microsoft.com, will go through my in my VPN tunnel and then external stuff to like say Facebook, that won't traverse the VPN tunnel. Now there's benefits to both, right? Because if I'm full tunneling my traffic, that means my VPN pipeline has to be big enough for all that traffic to go through. All of Facebook traffic, YouTube traffic, all that is coming through my internal pipe. If I don't full tunnel it and I split tunnel it off, you may lose visibility on what people are going to. So from a security standpoint, it may not be as good. From a usability and network engineer standpoint, split tunnel is amazing because you're saving pipeline and not having to force all that traffic through. So those are some considerations to think about when it comes to VPN architecture, if you're not familiar with it. 
with split tunneling versus a, a full tunnel, one thing to keep in mind, if you are a Microsoft 365 customer, Microsoft publishes guidance that recommends against tunneling your Microsoft 365 traffic because Microsoft operates so many points of presence throughout the world and is one of the largest, if not the largest owners of private fiber in the world. The fastest way to access Microsoft 365 resources is to get to the geographically closest point of presence. And even if your data isn't in that region, so say, for example, you're traveling and you're in the Asia Pacific region, but your company's based in the United States, it's actually faster to get on that point of presence and say like a Hong Kong and then traverse Microsoft's private fiber to the data center in the United States where your mail is stored as opposed to going over the public internet or worse yet, going over your VPN tunnel back to your corporate headquarters, wherever they may be, and then egressing there. So that that's one point is that if you're experiencing any service degradation with Microsoft 365, for example, Teams meetings, that's something you should check. The other thing, also another point against full tunneling, is the way the modern internet infrastructure works. So many things today are behind a, a CDN, which is short for Content Delivery Network, and they do a lot of intelligent things around determining where you're coming from and serving you that data as geographically and, and from a network perspective as close as possible. And so anytime you're doing something to kind of end around that, whether it's a VPN for personal or privacy or security purposes or an enterprise VPN, you're sometimes going to have performance degradation there too. Where for example, if you're trying to stream like Netflix and you can't do a 4K stream, it could be a reason like that why it won't work because you just don't have enough bandwidth or you have too much latency or, or whatever is preventing you from, from doing it that way. So with modern internet design principles, doing VPNs, whether they're personal or, or enterprise, do break some of those designed assumptions around how you're going to access it. So in general, I would say the trend should be if you are doing full tunnel to really reconsider that and look at how you can reduce your dependency on that. Andy talked about things like visibility Maybe there's other ways to achieve that visibility instead. So some thoughts there, but the number one call out is if you're an M365 customer, that's basically advice not to do that. Yeah, really good call out there, Adam, because this is one of those contentious points sometimes between security and the business where security wants visibility. They want to see whatever people are doing, not necessarily like spying on them, but making sure that the network isn't compromised, right? And so they want that full tunnel, but from a user standpoint, from a network standpoint, from a business standpoint, it doesn't make sense to do it because usability is much better in a split tunnel scenario. So that's where those heads may butt and, you know, you may have to give up some of that. But as Adam said, there's other ways to secure that data versus having to use an antiquated system like full tunnel VPN. So VPN has some vulnerabilities that we want to think about as security professionals. For one thing, many VPN vendors, which actually are the firewalls themselves like Palo Alto or Cisco, they come with VPNs and many of those clients lack the ability to integrate with modern identity providers. And so because of that, you can't use MFA. A lot of them use like LDAP or some AD integration to pull in the users and passwords, which great, you can authenticate using a username and password, but it's not authenticating using a modern authentication protocol and you can't use MFA with it. And so that for me, is probably the number one issue is when your username and password get compromised, I can then sign in using that to then get into your network. Andy, before Most you move on to the next point, I want to add a little color there. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that the more times I can prompt somebody for more different credentials, the better my security is. That's kind of this false equivalence. Security professionals often make that prompting more frequently or prompting for more things is better. So if I 
have you sign into your Windows PC with your username and password. And then I prompt you to sign in with that same username and password again for your VPN. That's somehow better. It's not. Um, or on the other hand, don't think that adding MFA to the authentication process for your VPN has to be onerous to the user. As an example, modern VPN providers support SAML so they can integrate with your identity provider. Now, as an example, if you use Azure Active Directory as your identity provider and you federate your VPN provider with SAML to Azure AD, you can actually then consume the Windows Hello for Business primary refresh token that gets generated when a user signs in with Windows Hello for Business, which we've discussed is a multi-factor authentication method, and automatically and seamlessly sign the user into VPN. And you may say, well, that's not that, that's not MFA. Well, it sure as heck is because they needed two factors. They needed possession of something and they needed either a knowledge factor or a biometric. And the user actually doesn't even see another prompt. They get seamlessly signed in. So this is actually how in Microsoft IT, how the VPN works. You don't get prompted for any additional authentication when you sign into VPN because you just did it when you opened your PC. So don't make the the assumption that adding MFA to your VPN has to be onerous or has to degrade the user experience. You can actually require MFA. MFA is required for the MSIT VPN, but it's invisible to me, the user, because I already did MFA when I unlocked my PC. So it's super seamless and great. So just to call out there that even though we're absolutely saying you should have MFA on your VPN, and if you don't, that's a risk, but we're not saying that has to be a bad user experience. Another issue with VPNs is a lot of companies don't segment their network. They have what's called a flat network, which means that anywhere on the network, you can reach everything. And that's very easy, but it's also very insecure. Um, there are some companies who segment off like critical infrastructure. Like for example, if you have an IOT network or if you have specific machines that are running production that can't be down, you may put those on a separate network, but a lot of companies for the most part have a very flat network, which means that if I have access to your VPN, I have access to your corporate network, including device discovery and all the vulnerabilities you have, I can run a vuln scanner and see what systems you haven't patched and go from there. So once I have in, I can escalate from there. A lot of VPN providers are also starting to expose the admin console to the external internet. You can do this through secure methods like HTTPS and whatnot, but you know anything that's exposed, especially a something like VPN is definitely a vulnerability. So VPNs also don't really follow the concept or uh, mantra of zero trust because, you know, just because a device belongs to an employee and it's connected to the network doesn't mean that it isn't compromised or should be trusted. And so it's very hard for VPNs in general to have integrated that device trust or device attestation device compliance into their authentication methods. There are some companies that I know that are using some, a tool like network access control or a NAC to integrate with other compliance providers. Like you can integrate with Intune or AirWatch or Jamf or something like that, where it has to be enrolled in the device the compliance check has to come from that device management vendor back to your NAC controls to make sure that it is compliant before it can come on. So I have seen that and that is a better way to do it. But in general, most VPN providers, it's just a network connection. They're not going to integrate any type of device compliance or device check into that. My stepdad used to have a saying that was nothing good ever happens after midnight. And as I found myself getting older and moving away from my younger years, I agree with that statement more and more. Nothing good happens after midnight. When I think of a flat network, I think of nothing good happens from client PCs talking to each other. There are almost no use cases today in modern IT environment. Again, 
back in like the windows 98 days, windows 3.11 days when we had windows for work groups. And those were all more peer to peer kind of networks. Okay. Maybe a work group that made sense today with a modern client server architecture, individual workstations have no need to talk to each other. And so dumping them all on a flat network where they can all go scream at each other and send each other uh, packets and TCP requests and everything else. Only bad things happen when that is possible. There is no benefit from that. And that's the kind of risk having a flat network exposes and having a way for me to drop my device on that flat network, even when I'm outside the physical building, again, just a risk, like just a risk you don't need. So flat networks, um, definitely risky. And then, you know, talking about zero trust as well, I, I just think of the concept of the amount of access VPN grants with a single set of credentials, even if you're doing multi-factor, and then allowing you to just sit and persist and have that access ongoing just really flies in the face of a zero trust principle where it's more get in, access a thing, get out. And every time you get in and out, I'm going to revalidate all of the things, identity health, device health, device compliance, every single time before you get access to a thing. VPNs don't work like that. And if you do have some of those pieces in place, great. You're, you're doing kind of the bare minimum here, but it's still not aligned to a full modern zero trust network architecture implementation, even with the best, most modern VPN implementation possible. It's still a lot of access without a lot of ongoing validation of the, the trust of all of those factors, the device, the identity, et cetera. So if there's all the ish, these issues with VPN, why do companies continue to use them? I think, for one, it's what they know. VPN has been around for 22 plus years, and the technology is proven, and people are proficient in deploying VPNs, and so it's, it's still around. As well as a lot of... <laughs> I can certainly attest to this. Uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it type attitude. You know, the what we call keep the lights on IT guy. You don't want to do anything that rocks the boat, right? Everything's working. Everything's great. Let's just keep it going. And then I mentioned as well, a lot of vendors will just include their VPN client as, as far as firewalls go. Um, they'll include the VPN client with it. And so it's included. It's free. It's you're paying your, your, you get what you pay for. And so might as well use it type attitude. So those are, I think some of the main reasons why companies are still using VPNs. Now let's talk about some of the alternatives. The main topic is really software defined perimeters, but I just want to mention one of the alternatives, which there are, uh, we're not going to dive down this particular rabbit hole, but we did do a great episode on Windows 365 with one of our global black belts, Bradley Dupay. That and any type of virtualization like Azure Virtual Desktop or Amazon Workspaces, those are also secure methods of getting into a, an internal network. And it's perfectly reasonable. It's actually one of the, the best ways that you can do it, but it does cost resources, which you know you can figure out the cost yourselves. Again, we're not going to dive down the virtualization talk, but just know that any type of virtualization that provides like a secure workstation would integrate that device compliance into your, uh, into your solution. And that way uh, you can get all the benefits of MFA device, all of that. And you're not really putting uh, another unknown device onto that network. The other thing that the, the main topic that we want to talk about is software defined perimeters. This is another way of thinking about it. If you didn't want to deploy infrastructure like virtualization, you can use these software defined perimeters. Now, what that is, is it uses software to obfuscate your internet connected infrastructure. So you're never exposing your full network. You're never exposing your firewalls. You're using a layer of software over that and so no one can see it except for users who are authenticated and are authorized to see what they need to see sdps have to verify the user identity and since they're modern they'll use modern identity providers and mfa and they can integrate the state of device into that authentication 
once the user is authenticated, it uses a micro segmentation. So individual network connection is set up from the endpoint to the server or application that they're trying to access and nothing else on the larger network is exposed. Network administrators historically have had to do segmentations at the switch level using pages and pages of VLAN access control lists or ACLs, firewall rules or whatever, but SDPs allow them to implement essentially a secure network connection and eliminating those flat networks. Now, I'm going to have Adam talk about one of the ways that Microsoft has that you can do this, and I'm going to talk about some of the other vendors, but the overall 50,000-foot view of it is you're establishing a single connection from your device after you've authenticated to the application itself and not tunneling your traffic like a traditional VPN where it's split tunnel or a full tunnel. It's literally what's called a micro VPN tunnel. So one single tunnel with a single purpose and it is generally uh, outbound only. So there's no inbound connections other than uh, really there's no inbound connections because you're authenticating usually to a identity provider that's external than granting access to a federated application on the inside. So the first one we'll talk about is a solution from Microsoft. It's called Azure Active Directory Application Proxy, or for short, we'll just call it App Proxy or Azure AD App Proxy as we go along. And this is one of the lesser known components of Azure Active Directory. If you are an Azure Active Directory Premium P1 customer, so that means you're a Microsoft 365 E3 or an EMS E3 customer, so you don't have to have E5 or any crazy license for this, you have App Proxy. Now, the way App Proxy works, Andy kind of started talking about it a little bit. It really has two key benefits. The one is more what we're focused on here around that access to internal applications in a secure fashion that's really targeted at just the application. But there's another major benefit too. And in fact, a colleague of ours, well, former colleague, Daniel Stefaniak, who used to be at Microsoft, said, Really, the key selling point of Azure AD App Proxy is the fact that it does single sign-on translation from kind of legacy technologies like forms-based authentication, header-based authentication, integrated Windows authentication, Kerberos, all that kind of old stuff, and translates it to new modern technology like OpenID Connect that Azure Active Directory is based on. So you can go sign into a very legacy application even from an iPhone, an Android phone, a Macintosh that never supported integrated Windows authentication and still get a single sign-on experience. So I'll give you a real-world example of this. Microsoft is a tool, and I swear we keep this around for the sole purpose of demoing App Proxy, and it's called TAR. I've mentioned it on this show many times because it's a great example. It's called Time and Absence Reporting is what TAR is short for. And it literally looks like an application from, it's got to be like the IE5 days. This thing is ancient. It is ugly as sin. <laughs> it, it's straight out of the 90s, like World Wide Web kind of aesthetic. And yet, to access it today, you can go, if you're a Microsoft employee, tar.microsoft.com, and it'll pop right up, and you'll get single sign-on to it if you're already signed into Azure Active Directory. And I mentioned you can sign into it on platforms that never supported integrated Windows Auth. And it's technically... This is an application running inside the Microsoft corporate network, but you don't need VPN. You don't need to be sitting in an office or on CorpNet, which actually wouldn't do you any good. We'll talk about that in a second, but you get that seamless access to the application you need. And that application can show up side by side with all of the other like third party single sign on apps you've configured in Azure Active Directory. So you could have ServiceNow, Salesforce, Workday, TAR shows up right alongside it. And to the end user, it's no different how I access it. Here I'm on my My Apps portal. I click any one of them and I go to the thing. I don't care how it works behind the scenes as an end user. I just know it does. And I know I'm automatically signed into it and it just works. So that's a great user experience, right? But so how does this work behind the scenes? You know, what, what do you need? Well, I mentioned from a licensing perspective, a premium P1, that's all you need there. 
uh, comes with basically any E3 package you've got. And then what you do is you install, there's an app proxy agent or a connector that you install on premises. And this is where Andy was talking about that connects back to the Microsoft cloud via an out bound connection and, and really emphasize the outbound there because you don't have to open any ports. You don't have to put anything in the DMZ. It's a direct outbound connection. So very, very secure from a network configuration perspective. And you can install as many connectors as you need to support um, different applications that might have different line of sight requirements. If you do have any network segmentation in place and uh, from there, you're off to the races, you configure conditional access policies in Azure Active Directory that users have to meet to gain access to them. So you can say, for this application, you just need to do MFA. For this application, you need MFA and a managed device. For this application, you need both of those things, but you're also going to be signed out after 30 minutes because it's very sensitive. So you can even define different policy on a per app level. Do you, do you see, are you kind of picking up the security benefits of this here? Great user experience, but also now I can write policy down to an individual app level and different policy based on the sensitivity of each application. And just because I have access to one application doesn't mean I have access to another, right? Because those have different policy and they're, they're completely like you called it anti micro segmentation. So this is really, really, really cool stuff. And there's no, um, you know, usage fees or, or, bandwidth costs or anything else associated with this. If you own Azure Active Directory Premium P1, you have this and you can take advantage of this today. So this is something I tell customers about and they're kind of blown away. They're like, I didn't know we had that. That's cool. And again, the remote access thing is one part of it, but that that seamless single sign-on experience, that's a big component too, because you can take your legacy applications where perhaps the app developer is long retired from your company and nobody knows how to modify the source code or even knows where the source code is, but this app continues to slog along in production and nobody has the guts to touch it, but you'd like to bring it forward and modernize it. Here's a way you can bring modern authentication, multi-factor authentication, device compliance, device health with Defender for Endpoint, identity health, and factor in all of those things for access to that app. And now it's way more secure than it ever was even sitting inside your network before and having people VPN to get to it. So today, just to kind of wrap this up, we use this a lot at Microsoft and it's to the point now where the majority of our internal apps are exposed through app proxy, where we reached kind of an inflection point. And I got an email several weeks ago now, Andy, you got it too, I'm sure, where it was announced that our VPN will no longer automatically connect on our Windows PCs. It is now an opt-in connect only when you need it VPN because the number of use cases where you need VPN today at Microsoft are so low. So the default behavior is a, a MSIT managed device sits on the public internet and it accesses any internal applications through app proxy just in time when it is needed. And that's it. They don't sit on a VPN all day, every day. And if there is a legacy application that maybe hasn't been exposed with App Proxy yet or can't be, those are the only scenarios when you use VPN today. And just to tie this off, even inside of a, a Microsoft facility today, so if you go in a Microsoft office, like a sales office, we have one here in Des Moines, I get presented with a Wi-Fi network called MSFT Connect as an employee. And my Surface Book will automatically connect to that network. But all that network is is it's an internet connection. There's no MPLS back to CorpNet. There's no site-to-site -site VPN or anything like that behind the scenes. It's just an internet connection. That's all that's being granted to users anymore. So there is very little concept of the quote-unquote corporate network today in how we operate. And, and I get that this is an aspirational state for a lot of other organizations that aren't there yet. But just to let you know, this is possible. This is achievable even for large multinational companies with hundreds of thousands of employees, you too can get there and get to this state. So some really cool stuff here, but that's app proxy and that's how we use it in the real world. And correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, but app proxy is for web applications, like for desktop applications that may require a VPN connection to like a database or something like that. 
this is probably not the solution for you, right? Probably not unless and only you have a scenario where all the communications are over HTTP or HTTPS and they don't require authentication. So there is one scenario I've seen where app proxy is used uh, even for more of a kind of a, I don't want to call it a headless service, but like a service that doesn't have like a web GUI front end. So there's a use case where if you have a certificate server, an Endes server, and you want to make that internet facing, so your mobile devices, your iPhones, your iPads, your Android devices that are enrolled in Intune can pull down certificates. You can actually expose an Endes server through app proxy, and then your mobile devices can hit that Endes server even though it's not public facing and you haven't opened any ports to do that. So there's actually a mode with app proxy where you say there is no pre-authentication requirement. So I don't have to satisfy like a conditional access policy with Azure AD to get through it and to get to the service on the back end. So there might be some use cases where that makes sense. Obviously tread lightly there because you're not putting all of those hardened conditional access controls on the front end of the application. Now you really are taking any traffic that says, Hey, I want to get to that thing. And you say, okay, cool. Pass on through. So make sure you have authentication at the app level in those scenarios or either that or nothing sensitive of any kind is being exposed, but there's obviously greater risk with that. So again, tread lightly, but there's use cases where it's needed or it makes sense. Right. And so you did mention that there are scenarios where maybe app proxy may not work. And Mm -hmm. even for Microsoft, we still have that VPN backup. We do. Right. Because there's examples like, Um, there's a plugin for Excel to access like sales data, reporting data, and you have to be on VPN for that to work as an example. So there's some things that just, if they don't have a web, you know, a web based front end or a web GUI, they're not a good candidate for app proxy. Right. So that's a great example. And for those things, I like the product called Zscaler private access. Zscaler is a partner of Microsoft's. We don't get paid by them. We're not sponsored by them, but I have deployed Zscaler private access in a production environment and I'm familiar with the deployment. So I really like this. They take advantage of this SDP. They're one of the products and vendors that you can buy out there. There's many of them, but they take advantage of the micro segmentation that we talked about in this SDP concept. And so very similar to how app proxy works. There's a connector that's deployed on prem and it's usually an appliance you can deploy it virtually. And um, from that, the client is authenticated uh, at the endpoint using modern authentication. You can integrate it with all of the IDPs, Azure AD, Okta, Ping, whatever it is, because it supports SAML authentication. And from there, you define the best way to do it is through DNS. So every resource that you're trying to get to, every application you're trying to get to should have a DNS attached to it. Network engineers are very uh, familiar with IP addresses and sometimes get lazy and not put a DNS entry to a specific IP address. But in general, ZPA works better with DNS. It can work with IP addresses as well, though, but... um, you can use wildcards, you can use whatever you want, but I can define if I want to say tar.microsoft.com, that's the the application that I want to get to. I can define that as access only for a certain security group, for a certain user. Dscaler does the front end authentication through the software, but then of course the application still has to have the correct permissions on the back end. You can do like RDP to a server, you can segment out different ports if you wanted to do that but the technology that establishes the connection uses this concept which we really liked because if i do an rdp to a specific server it's going to give me access but it's only going to give me access to that particular server right it doesn't expose the rest of the internet the the corporate network to me so i really like this i thought it was really easy to implement it does take a lot of feed and caring because as you discover, users are going to go to a lot of different internal resources. And sometimes if you have resources that are externally available or on the 
uh, internal internet and you're using, say, a star dot, you know, contoso.com as your wild card, it may try to route that traffic internally to try to get to an externally available uh, resource. So there are some network considerations that you want to think about when you're doing something like this. Other particular vendors, um, you know, Perimeter 81, NetMotion are, are two of the top in the industry. Uh, Blast Wave, which is where the idea for this particular episode came from, which I'll link the, I think she, she is the CISO, um, former red teamer uh, who wrote this blog on Blast Wave, which is a vendor. Um, but she talked about SDP versus VPN, which is essentially where we kind of took this idea and turned it into a podcast episode. So a lot of different um, things that you can do. Try to, in my opinion, move away from VPN because of the vulnerabilities and then try to get into one of these other methods. Like Adam said, at Microsoft, we really don't use VPN all that often. I think I've only connected one time since I've been back at Microsoft since last June, and it was for a specific uh, data that I needed. But other than that, everything else has been available. Now, I have had some instances where it's not available on a non Azure AD join device because there may be conditional access for a particular application that is internal that has to be on a, a join device or some other conditional access that Microsoft has put in, but it's not from the network standpoint. So anyways, any final words on this, Adam? Good discussion today. And the blast wave blog post that, kind of triggered this conversation today has a really funny head, funny headline it's house of cards your guide to getting hacked using vpns so obviously like an attention getter for sure but there's a lot of good points in there a lot of um it's healthy and good as security professionals to re-examine our assumptions and why we're still doing things the way we are and this is the way we get better because the attackers they're so clever you know, we did an episode several weeks ago on lapsus and some of their really novel techniques and way they're going about doing their business. And how the heck can we keep up if we're like, eh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Oh, it's good enough. Oh, it's fine. We haven't had an issue. Like that's the kind of complacent attitude that gets us attacked and opens us up to risk. And so I love taking things like this where is VPN the source of all of your security risk? No. No, it's not. But is it definitely an attractive attack surface? Yes. And so that's why this is a fun conversation to have and ways we can reduce the dependency on it, if not outright eliminate it, and some other options to do that, some of which you may already be licensed for or entitled for today, I think is a really fun conversation and something our listeners, the security professionals of the world can take back to their orgs and maybe go pilot at proxy, or maybe give Zscaler a call, check out what they have to offer. There's some better ways to do some of this. So I love discussions like this today, where it's something that everyone can relate to. And there's really actionable takeaways from the conversation that our listeners can go try out for themselves. And that's our episode for this week. Thanks for listening. As always, our contact information will be in the show notes. If you guys have any questions. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.